Welcome to lecture 35, the Frenet Serre apparatus, describing curves in 3D, twisting and turning. So in this lecture, I'm going to give you an introduction to differential geometry. I'm going to learn about the differential geometry of curves in 2D and in 3D. And you should know, or perhaps suspect that the differential geometry of 2D surfaces in 3D or higher dimensions is actually quite complicated. But the differential geometry of curves turns out to be elementary enough that we can actually present it in this class, and that's what we're going to be doing in this lecture. So we're going to consider a curve, alpha of t. t is some parameter. You can think of it as time. And the curve is in 3D, so there are three components, alpha 1 of t, alpha 2 of t, alpha 3 of t. And I can write it either in terms of a vector, as a tuple, or I can write it as a set of components of the three unit vectors, which I'm calling 1 hat, 2 hat, and 3 hat. You can think of these as i, j, k. You can think of them as x hat, y hat, z hat. You can think of them as e, x, e, y, e, z. Whatever you want to think about them doesn't matter, but there are three unit vectors. Those unit vectors are perpendicular to each other, and they form a basis for the three-dimensional space. So the next thing we're going to do, if we have a curve that is parameterized in terms of a parameter that we would call time, we want to find its velocity and its speed. So the velocity is simply the derivative of that curve, alpha of t with respect to t, and the speed is the magnitude of that derivative. The velocity is going to point in the direction of the tangent vector, which is the unit vector that points in the direction of the velocity. So I take the velocity and I divide it by the speed in order to get the tangent vector. Now let's look at an example. Consider a helix. Now a helix looks kind of like a circle. So I have a r cosine t, r sine t, that's the x, y components, and they're winding around like a circle, but every time they wind around the z value increases, and it increases linearly, and then I get this spiral as it's pictured for you. So I have r cosine t, r sine t, and I have h times t in the z direction. So let's go ahead and find out what is the tangent vector of it. So d alpha dt, which is going to be the velocity, is just minus r sine t, r cosine t times h. Let's figure out what is the magnitude of that. Well, when I calculate the magnitude of that, you should find out it's going to be the square root of r squared sine squared t plus r squared cos squared t plus h squared. But the sine squared plus cosine squared is equal to 1, so it just equals the square root of r squared plus h squared. And indeed, the velocity, or the speed, if you like, which is the square root of r squared plus h squared, is a constant for this helix. So I'm winding this helix with a constant speed, and then I just have to divide the velocity by that speed to get the unit vector, which is what we call the tangent vector. Now, we've talked about arc length before. And if we parameterize the curve, not in terms of time, but in terms of the arc length, which we would compute by calculating the velocity, taking the square root of it, so calculating the speed and integrating that with respect to time, we parameterize via the arc length, then we have what is called a unit speed curve. And then when we take the derivatives, the derivatives are automatically unit vectors. And so it's often very convenient to work in terms of the arc length, rather than in terms of a parameter that we would call time. So we like working with unit speed curves. Let's figure out how do we make it a unit speed curve for this helix example. Well, the arc length is just the speed, which is square root of r squared plus h squared, integrated over time. That just becomes t times the square root of r squared plus h squared. So if that is equal to s, then t of s will equal s divided by the square root. So I can just go into that parameterization. Every place I have a t, replace the t by s divided by the square root, and I now have the parameterization in terms of arc length for the helix. So let's go ahead and do that, and we're going to get r cosine of s divided by the square root of r squared plus h squared, r sine s divided by the square root of r squared plus h squared, and h s divided by the square root of r squared plus h squared. Now let's take the derivative with respect to s. That automatically gives us the tangent vector because this is a unit speed curve, so it will be a unit vector. And indeed, it's going to exactly equal the tangent vector that we got before. It's just naturally comes out that way when we take the derivative, because when I take the derivative with respect to s, I get a 1 over square root r squared plus h squared, multiplying each of the three terms in that vector. 
All right. So the tangent vector is going to tell us exactly where we're going along the curve in the next instant. If the curve is a straight line, that's all we need to know because the tangent line will stay the same and the curve will just move in a straight line. But if the tangent vector changes direction with time, we have to figure out a way to explain and describe how the tangent vector changes with time. And if the tangent vector changes with time, then we're going to have a curved path. Now, if I take the derivative of the tangent vector with respect to the arc length, that is going to be perpendicular to the tangent vector. At first, you might say, why? Why in the world is it perpendicular? Remember, tangent vector is a unit vector, so its derivative must be perpendicular to the vector because the magnitude of the vector cannot grow. So because the tangent vector is always a unit vector, if I take the derivative with respect to the arc length or with respect to the unit speed curve, I'm going to find a vector that is perpendicular to the tangent vector. So we're going to just define that as a new vector. We're going to call it the normal vector. And the normal vector need not be a unit vector. So we're going to give its magnitude, we're going to call that the curvature. And we're going to label that by kappa of s. So dt by ds is kappa of s dot n, where n is the principal normal vector, and kappa of s is the curvature, and n is perpendicular to t. That's very important that you remember. The normal vector will be perpendicular to the tangent vector. Okay, so let's first make sure that this notion of curvature, which is just a definition at this stage, actually makes sense. Let's take a look at a unit speed curve of a circle. So a circle in a plane is just r cosine s over r, r sine s over r is zero. Let's look at the tangent vector of that. If I take the derivative with respect to s, I'm going to get Cosine, I'm going to get minus sine s over r, cosine s over r is 0. It's very easy to see that's a unit vector, so indeed this is a unit speed curve. And then let's look at the derivative of the tangent vector with respect to s. That gives me minus 1 over r times cosine s over r, sine s over r, 0. And so I'm going to define my normal vector to be minus cosine s over r, sine s over r. If you look at what the what the curve itself was, which was r cosine s over r, r sine s over r is 0. You can see this normal vector is in the opposite direction of the radius vector or the radial vector. It points inward. Of course, we know the acceleration when I'm moving in a circle points inward. And the normal vector is the direction of the acceleration because it's the second derivative or the derivative of the velocity with respect to the arc length. Now, kappa of s is the number that multiplies that. Well, kappa of s is 1 over r. Now, if you have studied curvature before, you will know that 1 over r is indeed the standard result for the curvature of a circle. The circle has constant curvature. It doesn't change because at every point the, curve, the circle looks the same. And it's clearly obvious that if the radius is smaller, I'm curving much faster than when the radius is bigger. So I want an inverse relationship for the curvature of a circle. And so the most natural way to describe the curvature of a circle is as 1 over r. And that's what naturally comes out of our definition of the curvature when we define the curvature in this form in terms of a normal vector times kappa of s and having that equal to the derivative of the tangent vector with respect to s, or if you like, the acceleration, or a unit vector in the direction of the acceleration. Okay? A lot to swallow, but actually this is stuff that you already know fairly well. It's just we're using some slightly different words to describe things that you've already seen. All right, let's move on, and let's try and work this out for the helix. So if you remember for the helix, the tangent vector was equal to this object here. I'm not going to read it out for you. We've calculated it. You're familiar with what it is. Let's take its derivative with respect to s. So dt ds is going to be minus r times the cosine of s over the square root of r squared plus h squared. I'm going to get a minus sine times this. And I'm going to have an r factor out in front. And then we're going to get 0 because h dh by ds is 0. And I get an extra factor of 1 over square root of r squared plus h squared. So the net factor is r over r squared plus h squared. And you can see if I factor that r into what I'm going to call kappa of s, I have a unit vector, minus cosine 
s over square root of r squared plus h squared minus sine s square root of r squared plus h squared and zero that's a unit vector so that's going to be our normal vector and then the curvature is going to be r over the over r squared plus h squared and that is a constant so this helix similar to a circle has a constant curvature but it isn't actually a circle because it's moving outside of the plane so something that has constant curvature does not necessarily mean that it's a circle so that's an important thing to remember as well so the helix is something that has constant curvature but is not a circle and you can see in the limit as h goes to zero where this becomes a circle the curvature goes to one over r which is what the curvature of a circle is so everything seems to make sense all right let's move on we have one more thing one more object we have to look at it's called the binormal Okay, so, so far we found two orthogonal vectors, the tangent vector and the normal vector. If I have one more perpendicular vector, I'm going to have an orthonormal basis for 3D. So we're going to just define the binormal vector, which we're going to call B, to be the cross product of T with N. That guarantees that it's going to be perpendicular to T and perpendicular to N. Then the value of S for the three vectors, then for each value of S, the three vectors, T of S, N of S, and B of S, will form an orthonormal basis for three, the three-dimensional space, but as S changes, those can change directions. Now, we've already defined the derivative of the tangent vector with respect to S to be kappa of S times N. We're going to define another curvature that's called the torsion. Don't let the fact that it's called torsion get you all uh, screwed up or tied up in knots. It's just a name for this object that's tau of S, and it simply is the projection of the negative of the binormal the derivative of the binormal with respect to s on the normal vector direction that's what the torsion tau of s is simply take that as a definition similar to what we used as the definition of kappa of s when we were talking about the curvature okay so Let's go ahead and calculate this for the helix. Remember, t was equal to this. I'm not going to read it. We've seen it now a number of times. n we calculated on the last page. n was equal to this unit vector minus cosine sine. It points in the negative radial direction and in the xy plane. It has no component in the z direction. So now I have to form b, which is t cross n. So the easiest way I have to form it is to actually form this matrix by looking at the rows being t, n, and then 1 hat, 2 hat, 3 hat, and I just calculate the determinant of this thing. And when I calculate the determinant of this, that'll give me b. So you got to sit quietly and actually work this out. I really strongly recommend that you do that. You have to use the fact that sine squared plus cosine squared is equal to 1, and you will find that the binormal is going to equal h divided by the square root of r squared plus h squared, times the sine of s over the square root of r squared plus h squared times a unit vector in the one direction, minus h over the square root of r squared plus h squared times the cosine of s over the square root of r squared plus h squared in the two hat direction, plus r divided by the square root of r squared plus h squared in the three hat direction. And that defines what the binormal is. All right, take a deep breath. We still have to calculate the torsion. That means I'm going to now have to take the derivative of b with respect to s and take the dot product minus the dot product of that with the n vector okay well b is written above you it has its only s dependence is in the sine and the cosine so the sine becomes a cosine and the cosine becomes a minus sine and so i get h over the square over r squared plus h squared because there's a factor of one over square root of r squared plus h squared that comes out when i take a derivative with respect to s so i get h over r squared plus h squared times cosine of s divided by the square root times the one hat plus sine s over the square root of r squared plus h squared times the two hat vector now if you remember what n is n was equal to minus cosine sine and so if i take minus dbds dot n I'm going to just be left with h over r squared plus h squared. Once again, please pause the video, take a quiet moment, work this out for yourself, make sure you understand how to do this. This is the torsion. The torsion is a constant. And it's closely related to the curvature, which was r divided by r squared plus h squared. But of course, it's different. It's a different object. It is some kind of a curvature, but it's a different object than the curvature of the curve, which is what we call kappa of s. 
All right, we've now gotten five objects, the tangent vector, the normal vector, the binormal, the curvature, and the torsion. And those five objects are called the frenet serre apparatus. And you can describe every curve in 2D or 3D in terms if you know these three objects. And what we're going to claim is that these objects obey the following equation of motion. So if I take the derivative of a vector composed of T, N, and B, it's going to equal this matrix, which is a skew symmetric matrix, not symmetric because it changes sign. It's an anti-symmetric matrix, which has a kappa and minus kappa and a tau and a minus tau on the subdiagonals, and that multiplies T, N, and B. Okay? So let's verify that this is indeed correct. So if you recall, by definition of the curvature, we already know dt ds equals kappa of s n of s. And that's it. There's nothing else. So that is what the first row says. If I look at dt by ds, it's going to equal kappa of s times n of s when I multiply that matrix and look at the top component of the matrix. So there's nothing to do for the first part of this. Now, for the second part, I have to look at dn ds. So we're going to have to differentiate the normal, but rather than just differentiating the normal in general, I'm going to use the fact that t of s dot n of s is equal to 0. Now, if I differentiate that, that's still equal to 0. So dn ds dot t plus n dt ds is equal to 0, which means dn ds dot t is equal to minus n dot dt ds. But I know what dt ds is. It's equal to kappa of s times n of s. And I know n dot n is 1 because it's a unit vector. So that whole thing is going to equal minus kappa of s. So that tells me dn ds dot t is minus kappa of s. Well, that's the first element in the second row of the matrix. Now, similarly, we know n of s dot b of s is equal to 0. So let's differentiate that. We get dn ds dot b will equal minus n dot db ds but minus n dot db ds that's the torsion it's the definition of the torsion so we've just learned that the component of dn ds in the b direction is the torsion that is the third component in the second row and so of course dn ds has no component in the n direction because n is a unit vector so i have to have a zero in the center there and so that now has proved the second row of the matrix all right, third row. So because the derivative of, of the binormal is perpendicular to itself, we already know that the third component is equal to 0. Furthermore, we know that n of s dot db ds is equal to minus tau of s. And so that is the second component of the third row. And it seems like we're done, but we actually have to verify that db ds dot t is equal to 0. And to do that, we look at the relation b dot t equals 0, which we differentiate. We find that's equal to db ds dot t equals minus b of s dot dt ds. But dt ds is proportional to n. It's equal to kappa of s n of s. But n dot b is equal to 0 because they're orthonormal. And so that's going to equal 0. So indeed, we find db ds dot t is equal to 0. And that then is the first element of the third row. So we have now verified the entire matrix for this frenet serre equation. And so if you give me a T of S, N of S, B of S, a cap of S, and a tau of S, I can determine how the vectors change as a function of S. And that's all I need to do to determine exactly what's happening with the curve as a function of time. I have to integrate some differential equations in order to work it out. But essentially what this says is everything is determined by the initial values of the tangent normal and binormal and what the kappa and the, uh, or the curvature and the torsion are. And that determines everything about a curve. I think it's pretty neat that you can boil all of this down by using these neat identities from linear algebra about normal vectors and the fact that their derivative must be perpendicular and so forth and that it really all boils down to these two objects, the curvature and the torsion. Now, I also know that when you're studying this and you don't have a lot of experience with curvature and torsion, those objects are really hard for you to really wrap your head around. You just have to get used to it by seeing it enough. Now, you're going to have some 
uh, example problems you're going to work on in class, and there are going to be some homework problems you're going to work on, which will hopefully give you some of the notions about what these objects are, but you really have to work with them a bit before you get comfortable with them. It's like everything new that you've learned before. All right, we're going to go on to a summary page, and it's really just a bunch of definitions. The plane perpendicular to the binormal is called the oscillating plane, and if I have a planar curve, that's of course the plane that the curve is going to lie in. You can think of it as the instantaneous plane that the curve alpha of s lies in. The normal plane is the plane that is perpendicular to the tangent vector. And then we have a really odd name. The rectifying plane is the plane that's perpendicular to the normal vector. What this means is if we have a planar curve, then b of s is a constant. And tau of s must equal 0 because tau of s is proportional to the derivative of b with respect to s, but if b is a constant, it has no derivative, so the torsion must be 0. So if I have a planar curve, the torsion is 0. So the torsion tells me all about how the curve deviates from a plane, whereas the curvature tells me about how the curve curves inside the plane, or in the instantaneous plane that it lies in. All right, and so then there's a couple of points about the helix that I'm going to mention. A helix is defined to be a curve such that there exists a unit vector u that satisfies t dot u is equal to a constant for all s. If that is true, then there then the object can be called, that curve is called a helix. And then the book proves that if alpha of x is a helix by simply using that definition that t of s dot u is equal to a constant, then you can show that the torsion is proportional to kappa of x with some constant c. Now remember the helix calculation that we did. We found the, the curvature was r divided by r squared plus h squared. And we found the torsion was h divided by r squared plus h squared. So for the helix that we calculated, c was equal to h divided by r. And the fact that the torsion and the curvature are similarly related for an object that's called a helix has a name. It's called Longcray's theorem. Okay, that's all that we're going to talk about for differential geometry and the frenet serre apparatus. I, differential geometry is a really huge subject. It has a lot of very neat math in it. If you're interested in it, I strongly encourage you to explore it in the future. If you're really interested in general relativity, it is very relevant for a further study of general relativity. And if you want to study that, say, in graduate school, it's really important that you have some differential geometry under your belt, otherwise you're going to find that class to be a very difficult one to manage. And that is all that we have for this lecture. I hope you have enjoyed our short introduction to differential geometry, and I hope it has shed a little bit more light into the interesting mathematical relationships between curves and the way in which those curves sit inside two-dimensional or three-dimensional space.